as David said, search me. Search me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Convict me of my sin so that I can remove it from my life and walk more closely with you. Teach me what you have me to do. Give me wisdom because Lord left me to myself. I'm an idiot. I need you. I make mistakes and make bad decisions all the time when I step outside of the leadership of your word and the Holy Spirit. And in most cases, 
the illumination from that little candle was very localized and focused in one area. And that was great for one person. And it's important that we understand there is a specific revelation given to every man, woman, and yes, child, who would choose to open the Scriptures and study it for themselves. That's why I encourage you to do that just about every Sunday. Open up God's Word and study it for yourself. Because there is no better teacher and no better way to grow as a Christian than to spend time in the Word, just you, your Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit. And God will teach you. That's the land. And then the life is from the Hebrew word sunlight. It comes from a word, the Hebrew word was or, or, which described that beautiful sunlight that seems to light everything. And if you've ever been out in the morning when the sun first comes up and boom, it just lights everything. And it fills all the nooks and crannies and everywhere the light goes. Well, that's the broad revelation given by the Holy Spirit to all of us collectively as the people of God. Now, to form our, our sermon today, I want you to turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. In the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read just two verses. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. These are the words of Paul to his young protege, Pastor Timothy. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, first, let's look at the lamp. Or, I'm sorry, the light. Let's look at the light. I know that's backwards, and I've got it switched around in my own head too. The light first, because the light is the general, overall revelation of God's Word. And it's given to us in a number of ways, but it's given to us as His church. As a congregation today, we stand on multiple heritages. We stand on our heritage as a local congregation. Over a hundred years ago, men and women started this church. And since that time, the Word of God has been taught and men and women and boys and girls have had the opportunity to grow in Christ. But that's not our only heritage. We also stand on the heritage, as we mentioned earlier in the service, of the Protestant Reformation. Great men and women who stood for the truth of Scripture and said, we need to stand on Scripture more than on the words and authority of any man or woman. The Bible must be our guide. That must be the first thing. We stand on that heritage. We stand on what is commonly referred to as the apostolic heritage. Having come to us ever since the second chapter of Acts in the New Testament, when God sent the Holy Spirit and established the Christian church. Now, I'll grant you, there are a lot of different kinds of Christian churches today. And any of them that teach the Word and proclaim Christ, our brothers and sisters to us, regardless of what the name on the door says. And it's important that we remember that. But it's perfectly acceptable for those of us who call this our home to say, First Congregational Church of Duran is my favorite church. Not better, not best, no better, no worse, no comparison, but this is my favorite. And I have no qualms about saying that. This is my favorite of all the churches. But let's look at what the Scripture says. Under the category of the light, all Scripture, it says in verse 16, is God-breathed. That's why we incorporate the Bible into worship. It is inspired by God. The word God breathed comes from the same Hebrew word uh, root as the word God breathed life into them that we read in Genesis. When God created humanity and He breathed life into them. And it's important that we understand that the Scriptures are living and breathing and that they function within us as we take them in. All Scripture is God-breathed. 
The Bible is our source of truth because it is inspired by God. And because it is inspired by God, it is our foundation. It's the one thing that we go to that is consistent. Here's what our First Congregational Church core beliefs have to say about the Bible. We believe the Bible is God's Word to all men. It was written by human authors under the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is the supreme source of truth for Christian beliefs and living. Because it is inspired by God, the Bible is a reliable source of truth without any error. To which I can say, Amen. That's based on Scripture. Psalm 12.6 says, The word of the Lord is flawless. And Psalm 119.160 says, All your words are true. And 2 Peter chapter 1 reminds us that no one, no prophet, no writer, no teacher, ever did so on their own. It is all under the origin of the Holy Spirit as He leads and He guides. And so we understand the inspiration of God's Word and we incorporate it into worship because of that. Secondly, there's the instruction. The Bible, it says in verse 16, the second part of verse 16, is useful for teaching. Well, of course it is. That's why, that's why we have sermons. That's why our boys and girls are downstairs right now learning the Scriptures. That's why we have Bible studies from time to time. And we come together and with the wonderful brains that God has given us and the leading of the Holy Spirit, we read and apply the Scriptures to our lives. Because the Bible is inspired by God, it is true. And because it is true, it is worth our time. It's worth teaching. That which we teach is what we commonly call doctrine. Now, I don't know about you, but for many, many years, anytime I heard the word doctrine, I had to squelch this yawning reaction. Usually when we say doctrine, people go, oh, no, he's not preaching about doctrine. The word doctrine is not a bad or scary word. It is simply the word that we use in the church to describe that which we believe. Our statements, informed by Scripture, inspired by the Spirit, of what we believe. Now, there are certain doctrinal truths that are common to any church that calls itself Christian, regardless of the other names that are woven in there. The, all Christians believe there is one God. And He is revealed as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We believe that as part of that Trinity, Jesus Christ is God incarnate. And because of His great love for all of us, God sent Jesus to earth to pay for our sin with His own life, His own perfect life. Now salvation is universal in that it is available to anyone who would choose to receive it. However, it is narrow in that receiving Jesus is the only way by which a man or woman can be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Eternity in heaven awaits all who receive Christ based on God's grace and nothing we do. Not on works, but on grace. And someday Jesus will return to claim those who have received Him and make up His church. Now there's a whole plethora of interpretations of all that and we won't get into that today because we don't have a week. But we, we have a whole number of interpretations. The point is Jesus Christ will return someday to take His church home. And we instruct one another in that. That's one of the functions of the church, to instruct. Uh, also, Conviction. The Bible is useful for rebuking. It says in verse 16, the third part. Don't you just love a good rebuke? Don't you love a good fire and brimstone sermon where the preacher just gets right in your face and tells you all the stuff you're doing wrong? Of course, we all hate rebuke. And when you feel the need to go and talk to an individual, by the way, Jesus was very clear, if you're going to do that, do it personally. Do it privately. Do it carefully. Under the leadership of the Spirit. And that's another sermon. 
But the idea of rebuking, while it can involve one believer going to another in private and pointing out a scriptural truth as necessary, most of the time, I believe, it involves the Holy Spirit bringing conviction <coughs> upon each of us as individuals as we study the scriptures. That's why sometimes you sit in a sermon and you think, man, he's been at my house this week watching and listening, and that sermon was just for me. Or you're listening to something on the radio, a song or a, a teaching, and all of a sudden it just hits you and you think, I need to make some changes. That's conviction. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And how we respond to that has a great deal to do with how much we grow in Christ. And let's face it, sometimes Scripture is hard. It's tough. That whole love your enemies thing? Come on, really? There are people that really make that challenging, aren't there? I don't want to love them. In fact, I'm thinking more along the lines of Sodom and Gomorrah, or at least a plague of boils. <laughs> See? Scripture is hard. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Those are the words of Jesus. And they're hard. I want to believe He's going to forgive me, but other people are going to get what's coming to them. <laughs> See, it's, it's hard because our human nature comes into conflict at times with what the Bible teaches. And it's tough to apply those. But as followers of Christ, we must. Because James 2 says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking You mean I can't rank them? You can't, I can't take the commandments and put all the ones that, that, that I don't have any problem with at the top and make them worse? Because I don't struggle with those. But, you know, the ones that I have issue with, and certainly God doesn't really pay attention to those, right? See how hard the Bible is? It gets into our lives like a scalpel with a surgeon's accuracy and it says this. This is where I want you to be working. This is where you need to grow. This is, see, that's what conviction is. And so, most of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time, it is much more effective for the Holy Spirit to work through us as individuals as we study the Scriptures and to convict us so that we can grow in Christ. And as that occurs, we have the privilege as the body of Christ to gently share those truths with one another, not as a judgment, as an encouragement. Hey, the Lord's brought me through this. I'm dealing with that. I'm struggling in certain areas of my life just like you struggle. And we find that encouraging because we're all in this together. And then there is correction. Correction is a lot more gentle than conviction. Correction is, is those, those little course corrections. You remember the movie Apollo 13, right? Where they were looking out that little window, and, and, and if they don't make a little course correction, which basically consisted of a, a few little thrust, pulls on the, the thrust lever, and, they, and the, the ship moved all <coughs> an imperceivable amount, just a half a degree. But because they were so far out from the earth that they didn't make that correction then, by the time they got to the earth, they'd miss it by miles. And so they needed to make just a little correction. My friends, that's, that's life. That's the process we refer to in the church as sanctification. And it begins the moment you receive Christ as Savior, and it continues always until you leave this life. As we move and make little corrections under the leadership of the Spirit according to the Word, and we grow closer to Christ a little bit at a time. And then there's education. The last part of verse 16 says the Bible is useful for training in righteousness. This is the sum total of the instruction and the conviction and the correction. It's the process of discipleship. The, the training we do together and as individuals as we grow in Christ. And we kind of help each other and make sure we all grow together.
It's part of the function of the Christian church. Remember, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I taught you. That's why we do this. That's why I stand before you every Sunday and say, Open the Scriptures with me. That's why we teach our children. That's why we have Bible studies. Because we want to grow in the Lord as the light. And then, quickly, there's the lamp. This is where it becomes more specific. In verse 17, it says, The reason we do all this is so the servant of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Some of us have been walking in Christ for decades. And as gently as I can say it, we need to grow up. We need to grow up in the faith and apply the teachings of Scripture to our own lives. It's a lot easier to go around and apply them to everybody else's lives. But that's not what this is about. This is about me, Steve, not even Pastor Steve, stepping out behind the pulpit and say, Lord, as David said, search me. Search me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Convict me of my sin so that I can remove it from my life and walk more closely with you. Teach me what you have me to do. Give me wisdom because, Lord, left unto myself, I'm an idiot. I need you. I make mistakes and make bad decisions all the time when I step outside of the leadership of your word and the Holy Spirit. That's the lamp. This is where each of us takes ownership and responsibility for our growth. We make sure to apply the instruction of the Scripture so that we don't become like the person that James described who looks at themselves in the mirror and forgets what they look like. What a fool. When we sense conviction from Scripture, we respond the way David did in Psalm 51 when he said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. When conviction comes, do not try to debate it with God. He'll be right. So when He shows me an area of my life that is sinful, that I need to work on, there's no point trying to justify it. There's no point saying, well, you know, they used to believe that back then, but now this is a modern age. Or, certainly no point in ever saying to God, it's my life. To which he might just respond, oh really? Let's see how well you do with it. <laughs> he could, couldn't he? But he loves us. When the Holy Spirit points out the need for correction, just submit. Make it easy on yourself and follow the wisdom of Scripture and the leading of the Spirit. And through the process of sanctification, we grow in Christ as instruction and conviction and correction do their work. Now, the Bible is our only reliable source of truth. I recognize there are lots of good sources out there. But I've kind of come to the conclusion that all the ones that really have truth in them and they last and they're foundational and they help us live life, they got what they got from the Bible. They may not acknowledge it, but the truth comes from Scripture. Philosophy is a worthy pursuit. And many, many very intelligent people spend hours sitting around a pot of coffee discussing stuff and things. And we need the great thinkers, but have you ever noticed philosophy never really produces any concrete answers? It's always just thoughts and opinions. And it's worth, God's given us these minds for something. So I'm not saying to do away with philosophy. I'm just saying put it in its proper place. There is a plethora of great literature out there. Read it all. Grab it up and consume it. Wonderful things. The, the works of Shakespeare, the writings of Aristotle, all the wonderful classic works of literature. Yes, we should read them and expand our minds. But any reliable truth classic literature contains was in the Bible first. And any of us who have done anything academically or researched anything know you've got to go to the original source. It's the original sources that are important.
academic literature, by the way, is certainly worthy of study, and any of you who are in school, as I am, it seems like I've been there forever, that's a worthy pursuit. Work hard at it. Learn. Those of you that are younger and still in school, when your parents tell you to get in there and get those grades, go do it. Learn your stuff. It'll serve you well. But how are mathematics and history and English or science or anything else going to help us with the stuff of life? They're worthy. They're good. They're practical. But things like relationships, making a marriage work, raising our kids, walking with Christ, dealing with stuff that comes along in life that we didn't see coming, and it knocks us right on our backside. The academic pursuits are good, but they won't help with those things. For those things we need the Lamb, the truth of God's Word, and that is where He meets us. We all need the instruction and conviction and correction of the light of God's Word. We also need the individual revelation of the Lamb, as God through His Word speaks to us individually. Now, first and foremost, He's going to always keep saying, until we receive Him, you need a Savior. You need Christ. And so question one, as we move to a reflection time, becomes, do you know Him? What we know of Him and the plan of salvation is contained right there in the Scriptures. Secondly, we need the sanctification that comes with walking in Him, having received Him. Now we grow in Him, and we become more and more like Him. That's why we incorporate the Word, the light and the lamp, into worship. And by the way, everything else we do as a congregation. Fortunately, I always carry a spare set of feathers.